Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips. And as usual, I'll start with just a couple of um, announcements. Tonight, or next week rather, is our workshop on how to get out of the medical mill. And what I'm going to talk about is first of all how you assess your situation to determine if you've been sucked into the medical mill and then what you need to get out of the medical mill, how to talk to your doctors, how to put together a plan, just some basic stuff to get you motivated to take charge of your health. That's free. It's on August 16th, 9 o'clock p.m. Eastern. You do have to call the office or email me, pampopper at msn.com, if you want to register, okay? Second thing, how to get started, which is our four-hour program that teaches you how to get started, hence the name, how to get started. Anyway, it's going to be on August 27th, Saturday. I'm teaching it. Now, you might be thinking, I'm in New Zealand. I can't come there. Well, you can't eat the food, but you can watch it on Ustream. So if you want to do that and you're a member of Wellness Forum Health, let us know. and We'll show you how to get hooked into watching things as they go on in the office. And then last but not least, fall semester is in a month, and I can't believe it's in a month, but we are offering, of course, the Diet and Lifestyle Intervention course. Uh, we're offering um, autoimmune class. I'm teach teaching autoimmune diseases and uh, cardiovascular disease, food preparation, uh, microbiology, and chemistry. So really good repertoire of classes that you need to be a good scientist, and you can take one or all of them. Okay, I have a couple topics to talk about today. And well, let's start with genetics. I mean, discovery and mapping of the human genome was supposed to lead to greater understanding of the cause of disease, better early detection uh, for people at risk, identify them, and then um, more effective treatments. And in fact, I found this quote in the year 2000, Bill Clinton stated that genetics would, quote, revolutionize the diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of most, if not all, human diseases. Now, I'm pretty sure he believed that at the time, but the reality is that the results have been very disappointing. Genes have little to do with whether or not people develop diseases, and the study of the genome has yielded few better treatment plans for those who have common conditions like heart disease and cancer. Now, it is true that people carry genetic markers for disease. I mean, I have, I'm predisposed to develop certain conditions because of my family. Um, you all are too. The problem is that these markers don't tell doctors whether or not a patient will actually develop the diseases. For example, researchers led by Nina Painter at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston enrolled over 19,000 healthy women in the Women's Genome Health Study and then followed them for an average of 12.3 years. Their genetic risk scores were established, and then the incidence of heart attack, stroke, revascularization, and deaths from cardiovascular disease were tracked. The researchers concluded that genetic risk scores were not helpful in predicting the incidence of cardiovascular diseases in these women. Now, it's not surprising, and it's actually quite consistent with other studies showing that genes are a poor predictor of disease incidence. One of the best ways to study genes and disease is identical twins. And what has been shown is that diet and lifestyle are far more important than genetics. Now, a good example, researchers in Finland selected 16 same-sex and identical twin sets. And they chose them because one twin of each set was physically more active than the other. They followed them for 32 years. The physically inactive twins had developed 50% more visceral fat, 170% more liver fat, and 54% percent more intramuscular fat than their active twin counterparts. Now identical twins are great for these types of studies because first of all the identical genetics but the other thing is that they're generally raised in the same house and they have the same start in life, same diet and lifestyle habits as children so you really get to see what happens when their habits veer off in different directions and what, what twin studies show is that habits are really responsible for outcomes. Now, another group that we can look at that tells us a lot about genetics and health is the Pima Indians. There are two major communities of Pima Indians. One group lives in the Sierra Madre Mountains in Mexico, and the other group lives in Arizona. The two groups are descendants from the same families. Many married within their own community, and multiple generations of families live in one place. And this has allowed uh, researchers to track changes in the habits and disease rates of both groups and make comparisons between them. A lot of this research has been funded by the National Institutes of Health. Most Mexican Pima Indians are physically active, either because they're engaged in farming or because they have jobs involving manual labor. For example, women in the Mexican Pima group spend an average of 22 hours a week engaged in some form of physical activity, much of which is very physically demanding. 
The Mexican Pimas eat a diet that's low in fat and high in fiber. Their average fiber intake is over 50 grams a day. The Arizona Pima Indians, on the other hand, live a very Americanized lifestyle, which includes consuming a diet high in animal protein and fat. This group is a whole lot less active than the Mexican counterparts. For example, women in Arizona in that group are only spending about 3.1 hours a week in any type of physical activity, most of it not anywhere near as demanding. Now, there are big differences between these two groups, but I'll just give you one statistic that I think is very telling. 6.9% of the Pima Indians living in Mexico have diabetes, and 38% of the Arizona Pima do. Again, genes trumped by diet and lifestyle changes. Almost all studies involving these communities, like the Pima Indians, have concluded that diet is responsible for differences in health outcomes between the two groups. One research group wrote, and I think this is really clear, the much lower prevalence of type 2 diabetes and obesity in the Pima Indians in Mexico than in the U.S. indicates that even in populations genetically prone to these conditions, their development is determined mostly by environmental circumstances, thereby suggesting that type 2 diabetes is largely preventable. The study provides compelling evidence that changes in lifestyle association, associated with westernization play a major role in the global epidemic of type 2 diabetes. And so it couldn't be more clear. The research group said you start out with a group of all of them are genetically predisposed. Some of them get diabetes, some of them don't. It's almost entirely trackable to diet and lifestyle habits. Now still another clue tells us that genes are not the primary determinant of health is migration studies. And migration studies basically are looking at what happens when people move from one area of the world to another. Particularly in this case, what happens when people move from an area of the world where they enjoy basically really good health to an area of the world in which um, uh, health statistics are worse, and then what happens to them from a disease standpoint. Now I'll give you an example. Uh, Japanese women in the United States are significantly more likely to develop breast cancer than Japanese women living in Japan and other Asian countries. One of the reasons is that the Japanese diet is very low in animal food and fat, particularly saturated animal fat, than, than the typical westernized diet. Back in the 1940s, breast cancer was pretty rare in Japan, and at that time the Japanese diet was comprised of less than 10% of calories from fat. Now, today, within a very short time of moving to the United States, it only takes about 15 years, uh, Japanese women have the same risk of breast cancer as American women. Now, let's face it, their genetic makeup is not changing as they're flying over the ocean uh, to come and settle into their new American homes. The cause is the increase in the consumption of fat, protein, junk food, animal foods, and then their risk becomes just like ours. The same holds true for other populations and other conditions. Disease rates tend to be related to diet and lifestyle habits rather than ethnicity and genetic predisposition. Now I want to emphasize this doesn't mean that genes aren't important. They are, but there is difference, big difference, between having a genetic predisposition and those genes expressing themselves. And I said earlier, you may, I do, have genes that predispose me to develop diseases, but my behavior will determine whether or not I become a diabetic, develop rheumatoid arthritis and cardiovascular disease, some of the diseases that run in my family. Now this is really good news. I mean, I think it is. It means that you're in charge of your health. You're not a victim of your genes. I mean, let's face it, none of us got to choose our genes, so this is pretty good news. Now the key is you have to do something positive about it. That means that you're going to have to change your habits and uh, eat better and exercise if you don't want to fall prey to the normal diseases we get in this country. All right, second topic for today. Um, according to a lot of medical professionals, particularly those in the um, holistic, integrative, uh, functional medicine, um, naturopathic crowd, not all, but I could say big tendency there for this. The incidence of food allergies is rising and it's the reason why a lot of people are getting sicker and developing so many diseases. And an entire industry has formed to perform tests for food allergies and many practitioners make a great living doing all this testing and prescribing all kinds of restrictive diets and then supplements for treating the nutritional deficiencies that result from the restricted diets and, um, and administering therapies that are supposed to cure the allergies and all that sort of thing. 
Now, crystal clear here, some people really do have allergies and some of them are really serious, but most people don't. And many of the testing methods that are currently being used to diagnose food allergies are not reliable. And so what I think is going on, I know it's going on, is that food allergy testing has become another form of disease mongering. I mean, let's face it, the way you make money is taking people and turning them into, turn it into chronic permanent patients. And this is one more method for doing that. Now to evaluate whether or not the incidence of food allergies is really increasing. Researchers looked at over 12,000 published articles on food allergies, and I thought this was a stunning statistic. Only 72 studies met the criteria of using rigorous testing and inclusion of enough data that you could actually evaluate it. And after analyzing those studies, the researchers concluded that the incidence of food allergy in children is about 8%. In adults, it's about 5%. Now, that is a whole lot lower than the number of people who are saying they have allergies or who are being diagnosed with food allergies. The test most commonly used to diagnose food allergy is a skin prick test, in which a small amount of food is injected under the skin and then the blood is tested for IgE antibodies. The problem is that the test isn't real reliable, and the reason is that sometimes the immune system will create antibodies to a food protein, and the response is temporary, and it really doesn't repeat itself ever. So the mere presence of antibodies doesn't really tell you anything. This was confirmed in a, stu in a, um, in a study in which oral food challenges were given to confirm food allergies previously diagnosed through this type of testing in 125 kids. Most failed to confirm the diagnosis. The researchers concluded that in the absence of anaphylaxis, a skin prick or blood test should always be confirmed with an oral food challenge before restricting any food. Now, in case you're not familiar with this, an oral food challenge involves giving a food to a patient disguised. So, for example, um, you put small amounts of it into a capsule and, um, and then testing for a reaction. Doctors don't like it because it's real time consuming, but it is a whole lot more accurate. There's considerable overdiagnosis of some people based on faulty IgE testing. And I have to say, on the other hand, we have some very dogmatic people that say that if you can't find an, an IgE response and, and you don't go into anaphylaxis, that, that you can't possibly have a food sensitivity. That's ridiculous. Um, a lot of people, for example, react to MSG and don't create antibodies to it. But the real issue here is the overdiagnosis of food allergy often diverts attention from real issues that people could be helped with. And, um, patients are told that their fatigue or their hormone imbalances and other conditions are related to food allergies or intolerances rather than the fact that they're eating a diet high in fat, calories, animal food, processed food. Um, that's a whole lot more likely to be the cause of their problems. So allergy testing is an imprecise science and uh, I have seen many people over the years, members who've come in having had expensive testing done and they come in with Oh, sheaves of paper saying that they're supposed to stay away from. I've seen as many as 200 foods on the suspect list. It makes eating really difficult. And one of the questions I commonly ask people is, so since you started really watching your intake of these 200 foods, do you think things have gotten better? And one woman looked at me and said, well, if they had, I really wouldn't be sitting here now, would I? And I said, well, it's probably true. And that's, that's true in uh, almost all cases. So anyway, um, you know, just one more thing, beware. There are so many ways that, that all branches of medicine have designed to suck you into the medical mill. And what you want to do is stay out of the medical mill, okay? All right, that's all for today. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it. And I will be back to you on Thursday with more news.